So we have everybody. Everybody who's supposed to be here is here. That's how I believe. Welcome. Uh, my name is Yahel Gutman, and uh, my main career in life is that I've been an RN for 27, 20, almost going to 28 years old. Uh, and when I started uh, my career, you know, years ago, the only thing was that it was medications, diagnosis, patients, and uh, it was that state of mind that we, we, we are born, we live, we eat what we're supposed to eat, and uh, people get sick. So those are the differential diagnoses that could be for a headache and abdominal pain or whatever. And then the, they need to see a doctor, get a medication, get better hopefully, or not, or whatever. And uh, the reason I chose nursing, it was I thought that I could help people, you know, go through these journeys when they are sick, when they're not feeling well, or whatever happens. Uh, very soon after my very first few years of being an RN, I started to see things that then didn't really make sense to me because I did not understand it deeply, but I could see that like there was a pattern of these people who would get abdominal pain and I could see how anxious they are and stuff are going on in their life. And um, at that time I took a break for about a year and I traveled around the world because I said, well, the next thing I'm going to be married, have kids, whatever. And I traveled in India, in Thailand, so next thing I was introduced to, it was yoga, and Thai massage, and relaxation, and I started to see that there are people there who live totally different way, and they are not really familiar with all these diagnoses that we are talking about, and they eat different food. Some, they get sick, and some do better, but I kind of brought that message back home to Israel, and I started to see more and more in depth. So by then I was an ICU nurse, so I definitely could see the difference that if I would hold my patient's hand or I would do this or I would say, you know what, I have 10 minutes, I'm going to just sit here next to you. Not as a nurse, not giving medication, not taking their blood pressure, just taking time. They did much better. And uh, things were just kind of opening up to me. They needed a breathing treatment. Yes, we gave them that breathing treatment. They, they, you know, they were sometimes on ventilators. But then some internal voice would tell me, you know what, I just need to go there right now. And would sit and talk to them, and they would kind of relax. And once in a while, even it was like, I don't need that pill to go to sleep. I'm fine. So this is how I started my journey, and uh, for many years I did um, uh, holistic pulsing, which is, I don't know if anybody is familiar with that, you know, that the, it's a kind of a movement pulsing that brings up memories from childhood and it helps people heal the situations that they have. And I started with crystal healing and definitely was convinced that this is it. Then I met um, my husband, Dr. Gutman, and he was at that time a real doctor. He was talking diagnosis, medication, and I was kind of talking two languages and we started to share. And once in a while, when he would take a Tylenol, I would say, Michael, why did you take that Tylenol? Well, I have a headache. And he said, you might not need it. So what should I do? OK, so let's whatever. So the share of the experience brought us to the point that 
uh, we decided, okay, we want to open an urgent care, we want to offer people health services, and of course, even to this day, I know, I understand, if you're having a heart attack, if you have abdominal pain, something is wrong, you need to see a doctor, you need to be treated. But we believe that many, many of these situations, they have a cause that it's going back to lifestyle. What do you feel? How do you do? What is your relationship with you and your father or whatever, your surrounding? And of course, things happen always exactly at the right time. So when we opened the third location, and things were kind of more relaxed. I said, Michael, I need to go back to yoga. I've been very busy. I need to do, we're gonna go and do yoga constantly. And the next thing, I met my next teacher, which is Shankara. He's gonna talk about himself. I'm not very good about representing people. He's gonna say who he is. And um, all these lessons and whatever we, we learned, this is the reason that he's here, and uh, we feel obligated. I think we have a mission here to bring you both sides and give you the background and some tools to choose to be happier and live better, because I know it can happen. And the last person is... Um, last but not least. Yes, of course, <laughs> is Steve. Steve does acupuncture, so at the end he will represent also that part, and our next meeting is going to be mainly about that one. So he, He's going to just entice you yeah, with an appetizer to the yes. main talk that he'll give the next time. <laughs> if you want to. <laughs> so um, uh, I'm Michael Goodman, and uh, I am very privileged and honored to be married to Yael. And um, <clears throat> she has uh, been uh, uh, someone who's opened up my mind and perception a great deal, and, uh, and I'm thankful for that. Um, I am probably, if you met me 10 years ago, the antithesis of, uh, of uh, complementary alternative medicine. I'm very empirical guy. I got my PhD in physiology and uh, in uh, neural control of cardiovascular function. I've been an emergency physician for the vast majority of my life, uh, in my medical life, and that's actually coming on to be the majority of my life and and uh, and uh, I've you know it's been uh, life and death situations and very uh, very mechanically physically oriented uh, approach to people's health because by the time they arrived at my doorstep there was no alternatives I, I, I don't think that uh, flashing crystals across them would have helped them with their heart attacks or, or their um, motor vehicle accidents or broken legs but on the other hand um, and then the other part of my life is in which sort of goes along with with my previous life I was a soldier I was uh, I joined the army after 9/11 and I I went to Iraq for uh, and twice and to Bosnia and, and uh, saw horrible horrific things that people can do to each other and uh, and uh, and and um, it was uh, very uh, emotional, uh, emotionally draining, and uh, and uh, yet uh, a time for growth for me as well. And just just to open up my uh, mind to understand that there there's something, there needs to be another alternative to how we conduct ourselves in this world. And um, then I, I uh, a part part of. Being a soldier was uh, it's, it was very uh, stressful on my family life, uh, and it was the final uh, straw. And, and I divorced, and I and I, and uh, in my loneliness, I, 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 I and I, I met Yael, and she she uh, salved my wounds both from the war and from from uh, my divorce, and and brought me back to life again. And uh, and she's she uh, has taught me and and I we went to yoga together and met Shankar and and our lives have literally changed completely, and uh, so we we've we've met, learned a lot from each other. 
Um, so today, Shankara, Yael, and I, and, and anybody in the audience, including Dr. Payne, and, and, and anybody who wants to, uh, to pipe up and, and, and be part of this, this is not a pedantic, didactic kind of thing. This is, we, we, want, we want to hear from our audience and have questions, if, and, and uh, we, want, we want to talk about complementary medicine. So what is complementary medicine? Complementary medicine is not alternative medicine. Alternative medicine is uh, treating what ails, what you think ails you, or what people tell you ails you, in a way which is alternative to what Western medicine does. So, for instance, uh, garlic for hypertension. And I'm not poo pooing that, I'm just saying what it is. Uh, and, uh, or, uh, or doing uh, complementary thing, uh, alternative things for known uh, organic problems uh, that are completely exclusive to Western medicine. Complementary medicine, on the other hand, takes a more broad approach. It it uh, it entails utilizing both what's good in Western medicine. Western medicine has some very good things to offer, I think. And also pulls in what, what, what in the past, and this is something that's changing immensely and rapidly, what the, in the past Western medicine has put blinders on and has not, not paid attention to, which is the, the kinds of things that, that Eastern philosophy and the Eastern approach to health and wellness and, and, and the things that, that can contribute and prevent Disease. It's not disease. It's disease. It's 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 the lack of ease with yourself, with your soul, with your with your spirit, with your psychology, and and what 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 I've come to learn, and and I knew this. I knew this over time, and I've seen it. Uh, I mean, my own spiritual journey. Um, I used to be a I called myself an atheist, and then I became an, a, a, an agnostic, and now I'm more observant Jew, and, 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 and you know, it's not Judaism, it's not Hinduism, it's not uh, Islam, it doesn't matter. There's many roads that lead to, to, uh, to the ultimate power as far as I'm concerned, and so it's not the religion, it's the spiritual aspect of, 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 uh, of what it, what, what entails life, and what, 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 uh, what uh, brings life, and and when I would treat patients, and and some of them would live, and some would die, and I and and the ones that should have died would live, and the ones that should have lived would die, and 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 there and and I could see, I could see when I would treat patients that uh, when their when that last shred of of physiology had left their body, and there was nothing to bring back, there was something that went. You could almost see it come out of the body. There's, 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 there's something more, there's a ghost in the machine. There's, there's, we're, not more, we're more than the sum of our parts. There's something very, there, there's an essence of life that's within all of us. And um, then I started to get treated by Yael for my headaches. Like she would uh, touch me and she would send colors and, and my headaches would go, or I would get abdominal pain, it would go. And there was no medications. And I started, I started doing, uh, I, I started learning Reiki and, and I started doing Reiki on my patients. And I, and, and, uh, and, uh, I wouldn't try and cure them, I, but, but if they were anxious or uh, in pain, then I would start touching them. And then, and, and of course, you have to ask them their permission to, and, and so sometimes I would do something and say, do I, do I have your permission to be treat, to treat you? And they would say, of course, yeah, you're the doctor, right? So, so I'd treat them and, 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 and they would relax and their pain would resolve. And so I started to understand that there's more to, more to medicine than just the, this, this, um, just the mechanical aspect. And there, there's a, a ton of research out there now that's coming to fore, and, and it's been actually out there. One, one interesting piece of research that was uh, like about 15 years old. If, um, if you um, went, if, if uh, you, there's, you can get stress points. 
uh, for um, life events. So for instance, marriages are highly stressful if you're just getting married, or funerals are highly stressful. So you can, the, these psychologists started giving numerical numbers for these events. And the more stress points you accumulated, the more likely you were to get sick or injured. And, and uh, so, so if you accumulate a certain number of stress points, the likelihood of having what you and I think of as very physical organic issues like heart attacks or cancer or and, 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 and so our, our Western trained minds see that only as, okay, well, you know, there, there's a piece of wood and I stumbled on it. And so it was that piece of wood, but there's more to it. There's, there's much more. There's, uh, there's a, a chain of events that, that, that lead up to that, that uh, disease that, that, that uh, you're suffering from. So Western medicine, it's great. It's great at treating the end event of very physical things. We're good at diagnosing heart attacks, sending them to the cath lab, opening up that vessel that, that's clogging the, the, the nutrients and the oxygen to the, to the muscle. We're very good at that. Broken legs, broken arms, no problem. We know, we know how to treat those. What Western medicine is not very good at is treating, first of all, the causes, the ultimate causes, which I alluded to, and also treating a whole slew of other things that, that bother us and, and would ultimately lead to the, the bad, really bad things, the heart attacks, those things that shorten our lives and our quality of life, and that's anxiety and uh, fibromyalgia and um, um, uh, irritable bowel. Those are things that, that, that Western physicians, for the most part, they're frustrated with. They don't know what to do with them. And, and uh, you know, to... And, and I, 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 some, some of my colleagues, you know, they see fibromyalgia, they'll roll their eyes. Why do they roll their eyes? Because they don't know what it is. But it's a real thing for the person who's got fibromyalgia. It's painful. It's, it's, it's debilitating. How do you get to treating those kinds of things? And that's the kinds of things that Eastern philosophy and the Eastern approach is much, much better at. Yeah. They, they, they are, I, I, I think that f us Western folks, we're only 900 million in this world of 7 billion. You know, we're not that good. We, we, we think we're good, but we're not that good. Yes, we've got fancy buildings and shiny cars, and we've got the vast majority of wealth right now, but there's 6 billion other folks who seem to be doing okay. And some of them live in what we consider poverty, but their lives are not that bad as far as they're concerned. It's, it's, and, 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 it's, it's, and this is what I've learned from Shankaran, from my wife. She keeps on beating into me, get this ego out of you. This is, it's, it's the, the Western world, the Western way is an egocentric uh, uh, philosophy and approach. And, and, and this is part of what, what uh, Shankara has taught us and, and uh, Yael has taught me is, is how to get out of that mindset and to approach uh, your health and your well-being. And so I, 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 I don't want to take more away from uh, Shankara, so uh, I think I'll let him introduce himself. Hello, everybody. Um, Shankara is the name that I use in my professional life and most of my personal life. It's not the name my mother gave me, which is Clifford, but that's another story. So just forgive the you know, strange name, I guess. So um, let me begin a little bit about my background, and then I'm actually going to ask you in a moment to say why you're here. I'm going to do a short, really fast go through. Um, so more on that in a moment. Thank you. <clears throat> I began my journey 
I called my spiritual journey, but also my own healing journey when I was 18 years old. Um, before that, my father had passed away when I was 12, and it sent me into this great tailspin. And by 18, I was kind of done with the way things were and the world, so to speak. My mother had in her mind I was going to go off to college. I was actually going to a top prep school in Massachusetts, and all the kids were ready to go. And I went left, they went right. And I moved into a retreat center, a yoga and holistic health center, Kripalu. How many of you have heard of Kripalu? Anybody? Some of you have been there? Great. Um, that was back in 85, and spent the next six years cloistered with uh, about 300 other residents. Um, it was basically a, kind of like a yoga monastery. It's called an ashram. But at the same time, we were hosting retreats and workshops and seminars for probably about 10, 15,000 people a year. They would come for week-long retreats, month-long retreats. So pretty much everything that you're going to hear today is borrowed information for what we would offer people in health crisis, people in mental and emotional breakdowns, people in just trying to look for ways to get more fulfillment from life. So my journey, fast forward, um, I left the community. I, um, many years happened since then. And um, I currently, I have my son and I'm helping, um, I have two daughters, not biological, but I'm their father. And yeah, so that's that part of my life. And separate from that, about four years ago, I got my master's degree in um, basically in marriage and family therapy, which is kind of the equivalent in many ways of psychology and counseling. It's one of the five big mental health degrees in the country. Um, so when I'm working with, I have a private practice. I've been in private practice for about 18 years now. Um, I've been teaching yoga, meditation, and holistic health for about 26 years. And when I'm working with people, I'm doing everything I can to try to bring the synthesis, the incorporation of my, my personal experiences, my training in uh, more of the alternative Eastern, you know, yogic health, Ayurveda, mystical, mysticism, traditions, religious, spiritual traditions, but also from all the years of conventional training that I've had. And I think Michael addressed it really well. There's a, they're great allies. They're great partners. They need not be adversarial. However, for much of my years of having been out teaching in the public, it's been perceived that way. The holistic field is very much was regarded as fringe. It's over there. Um, I can recall when I was, I had just freshly moved out of the community and I was teaching at um, a big spa in the Berkshires Canyon Ranch Spa. Um, Somebody in our community had uh, targeted us as worships, uh, envoys of the devil. So, you know, some things change, some things don't. But the whole point of that is that the perception was very, it was very little receptivity. And it's been fascinating watching just the last 10, 15, 20 years, the progression of, of our thinking in this culture. It's like people have gone from sort of dabbling in these ideas to these days people are practically running to the alternative and complementary approaches. For just a simple example, that is at our yoga studio. We have about 1,500 to 2,000 people come through in any given week. And I would have been lucky. I was traveling all over Connecticut and the Northeast. I've been lucky to get five people a class. So um, I welcome you. We welcome you. And thank you for whatever reason you're here. And I'd actually like to hear if you can literally limit it to like a sentence. Um, I'm sure you have much of a story to tell, and it's important. <laughs> But just it gives me a little bit of a clue in how to how to guide the process, how to, to conduct the, the lecture today. So, would you start? Say your name and uh, why you're here. Thank you. Um, I'm Gabrielle Roberts. I am a Reiki master. I've been on a 
my own spiritual journey, and Rudri, and enlightenment, and <coughs> this is home. <laughs> <laughs> Talking about holistic, it just feels very comfortable for me. Beautiful. Thank you. Okay, please. And we'll I'm just Pat. go across the front row, and then we'll zip the back row. Okay, and I'm Pat, <clears throat> Pat? and I guess uh, two divorces and a, and a domestic abuse will just about do it, uh -huh. equals clinical depression. So. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, okay. those are those are the right conditions. Got it. Thank you. Right. Thank you, Pat. Carol Jessen. I dabbled in Reiki for a few years and got into yoga for many years and kind of stepped back. And I want to get back in. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Welcome. Elliot Jessen. Carol and I are married, still married after sixty years. Oh my God. And. Uh, I'm here primarily to expand my knowledge and so forth. Uh, I, I'm familiar with acupuncture and so forth, but uh, I want to learn more. Thank you. I'm Teresa Corbin, and I have a, kind of a medical background, um, but I am very interested in alternative uh, healing and um, holistic healing, so I'm here to learn. I'm Rosemarie Hargrave, and I was trained as a Norin, Norin was steeped in the Western traditions, and uh, interestingly found a book on uh, Adele Davis. Uh, it's the old Simsbury Library. It only went vertically. It's gotten so small. <laughs> and uh, I had been told you don't even read those books, and it made so much sense, and I then went to trip her up with another author and got more and more steeped in it, and uh, very much got interested into alternative healing and very much respect integrative medicine and to have been fascinated with the fact that it is more and more moving to mainstream especially yeah. to, to combine the best mm -hmm. of both. Right. Just an example of this, these guys and what they're trying to do. So mm -hmm. powerful. Yeah. I'm Diana and I am just I just want to learn more. I know there's so much to learn and I, I want to learn it. Yeah. Me too. Great. Mm -hmm. I'm uh, Diana's husband. My name's Ron. Uh, we were introduced to energy uh, medicine or healing through our oldest son, who mm -hmm. started to practice Sundo after he was in Europe for a year and he had done some uh, Qigong there. And so he was explaining this to us, and at that time it sounded like, you know, it's like this is really good. <laughs> and so I wasn't really open to it at the time, but then something happened in my life. I, catastrophic illness and uh, then it, and then I was receptive and uh, so we started reading and trying to educate ourselves and uh, uh, the last event that was here was the first time that we knew that there was anything in the area mm -hmm. that would, that shared that type of belief and it's really uh, refreshing to know and to be able to come here and learn you know so we're really enjoying it and looking forward to learning so thank you I'm Jason Prashat, and I'm happy to be here today. Listen to what you have to offer. There's so much that goes into a, the mind body spirit connection. And to experience it is one thing, and to understand it is quite a journey. So thank you for putting this on. My name is Kara, and I'm just here today to find Jason time to learn more about what person I have been interested in since my teenage years she told me about it. Um, I want my mind open. That was a conversation we had on the way over here. Um, I think one of the side things that I'm very interested in is I'm getting older. I have more things go wrong with me, and I'm really tired of taking a pill for it. And there's got to be another way. Sure. I'm Connie Winston. I'm the Connie. I share her philosophy. Um, I've been in treatment for, you know, depression, anxiety for a long time because I experienced losses at a very young age. And uh, I debated whether to come and I thought, you know, Connie, I've got to get I want to get to a point where I'm not taking pills for anxiety, depression, chemical drugs and you know, it doesn't work. And so I'm open to this and I'm here with my 
want them something else, <laughs> I can go just take a glad time and help them. Let's go back here. Hi, Hi my name is Akuza. <coughs> I'm actually here today in the culinary part of the <laughs> <laughs> However, I reached this age where my body is not working together with my mind. <laughs> I seem to need more and more uh, chemical attention from uh, regular medicine. I hope to learn that my body can reverse and do for me what it what it is supposed to do and did for many years before I start cracking at the seams. <laughs> <laughs> you can copyright that one. <laughs> yeah. um, my name is Lucy. Um, I have a master's in special ed. And I'm leading the logo and uh, a couple of the friends up from Japan, they said I have something. Okay, so when when I go to touch a crystal, they won't buy it unless I do because it all tingles and all that. Oh, wow. I do, when my students are upset, hold them for a second, like you did when, <laughs> when uh, I came in with my back. Um, but I gotta heal me before I can heal them. Yeah. Yeah. So that's why. Heal or heal mm -hmm. thyself. Yeah, beautiful. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Hi, uh, my name is Yoko Kawa. Uh, I have a four children. The, I, uh, I'm very interested in, you know, all the energy world. I love yoga, and I love Reiki too. Okay. And especially, you know, I know Reiki therapy is yeah. very comfortable. Yes, <laughs> yes, yeah. My name is Mary. I had done some volunteer work in the medical field and studied medicine on my own for my own self-improvement for about 30 years. Not doing it for anything, just for my self-knowledge. My undergraduate degree had been in psychology. And now that I'm retired, I'm getting my master's degree in developmental psychology. Great. And I'm very interested in the mind-body connection. Because yeah. I know there is one. I know we need to address both sides. Yeah. And having knowledge in both aspects. I'm not sure where I'm going to go with this, but I, I, I just feel it's important for me to open my mind to um, hear, get as much information as I can. Yeah, great. Thank you. My name is George Johnson, and I'm just here to learn something new. It means something new to me. Great. Welcome. Thank you. My name is Michelle Meyer. <clears throat> um, I think I've dabbled with quite a few different things. I've been to the college for a week. I didn't realize it was there. I wish I knew that before I had my son. <laughs> um, but, um, yeah, I'm trying to keep up with my 11-year-old, and uh, starting to feel a little bit like a hoover, like my body's not yeah. where my mind is at. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Excellent. Okay. Wow. That was that was awesome. So I have two thoughts, and then I'm going to segue right into what I want to talk about today. Um, one, a little bit more about my own journey. I came into this field not from a health crisis, but from a psycho, emotional, spiritual crisis. And it was um, ushered in with the passing of my father when I was 12. Let me know if you can hear me, by I can project easily. <laughs> and at that time, I, it was just obviously hitting puberty at 12. And I was thrust into this great, great um, state of absolute angst and uncertainty and panic and experiencing tremendous anxiety for particularly the first six years until I, I said, I'm done with this, and, and jumped in. Um, so a couple of you were talking about sort of mental health. And I also struggled with depression very badly for years and years. And using these ideas, using these methods, you're just going to get a little introduction today. And then um, Steve will talk a little bit more, introducing the acupuncture. Um, but these methods work. They work, and I know they work for me, and I <coughs> worked many different, there are, as you, some of you are listening, there are many methods to healing. And I think 
it's really essential you find the one or ones that work for you and if it's more on the quote western model allopathic model and it gets you to that <coughs> health model being great fine but obviously you're here because you're open you want to consider other possibilities so it's just been fascinating over the years like every two three months i hear about another method another system brought in from this country, from that culture, or developed within our own culture. So the suggestion is stay open, stay curious, and let it come to you. At some point, you'll find what works for you. Maybe today will be just another step or something you can really use on your journey. Um, so those are the two things, really, I think. So what is it we're really searching for? And that was where my whole journey began in the first place. And I think this is where sort of the end game of where everybody comes from. So and I think what we're all looking for is how to be more happy and more fulfilled in our lives. And how, to, how for everybody around us, those we care most about, to be happy. And I learned and was taught early on that in order to be truly happy, you have to be healthy because for most people their experience of happiness is connected to something that happens or something they do and because it's connected to something outside of us it's by its very nature temporary some things are more short-term some things are more long-term so we introduce first the idea in Buddhism of impermanence. That we invest, and we are a culture ever since the Greeks. We are, the, in Western, the whole model of Western enlightenment is happiness, love, and joy are all to be experienced outside of us. The very model of Western medicine is if you can't see it, if you can't predict it, if you can't measure it, then it doesn't have enough substance to validate it. So we invest so much of our time, our energy, our efforts into trying to secure happiness outside of ourselves. And those many things in our lives that do bring us happiness, there's always the one possibility, the one potentiality, which is that at some point it could be taken away from us. And I go back right to my own experience of the loss of my father. It was like life was one way and boom, now life was a different way. Okay? So we could break this down into smaller and smaller um, aspects of our lives. Okay? So we look for happiness here, we look for happiness there. We find it in this tradition, that religion. We find it in this career, that career. We find it in this car, that car, this kitty cat, that doggy. But then what inevitably begins to happen is that the happiness at some point starts to sort of wane. It slowly starts to ebb. And so at that point, we're then thrust right back into the pursuit or search for happiness in other ways. And so thus, though all of these Eastern models, they, they try to reinforce the reality that for so many of us, we're constantly in this search. We're constantly looking for something. Right? And on the one hand, that's a very beautiful thing. Because just as an example today, your search, whatever it is you're searching for, both what you know what it is and maybe what you're unsure what it is, it brought you here. But what I want to first emphasize is so many of our pursuits take us to things that inherently don't have lasting fulfillment or joy in them. They're temporary. Okay? The one thing, the one thing we can surely count on my experience that can bring us that lasting fulfillment is our own sense of well-being internal well-being and the foundations for well-being are physical mental emotional and spiritual health 
or what my teacher from India, he says, when we're in alignment, when the different aspects of who we are, our body, our mind, our heart or emotions, and our spirit or soul, or if you don't believe in, believe in those, we'll just stop at the heart. I think we can all agree, love and heart, and you know, those things exist. When these are in alignment or in balance with one another, only then can we experience true happiness. And this is really the, the, the dawning of awareness in our society, where as people are living longer, and people are having more and more of these experiences, these transition experiences, I forget what we, it was called in my uh, master's program, but life experiences, okay? That as we encounter and have more and more of these experiences, we get more and more perspective. We get more and more of an understanding in our lives. <clears throat> and we need models to help put it all into context. We need a direction in our lives, how to take our life experiences and use them to enhance and enrich our lives. And that's what the model of holistic health is. It takes all these different aspects, which are all sort of splintered, our relationships with our children, our jobs, our physical health program. It takes it and puts it all under a context, under an umbrella of understanding. And that's my hope today, is to kind of bring it all together so that you have both more awareness and understanding, but also my, my real desire, when I was talking with Michael and Yahel, is that maybe you'll leave here feeling a little bit more inspired to take those steps that you probably already know you need to take, and maybe you don't know which ones to take. But my guess is most of you probably do have some idea of what you need to do. But there might be an uncertainty, a reluctance, or maybe, you know, you just need a, a clear plan of action. Okay, is that clear? So that's what we're going to go into the next half hour to an hour. Please, along the way, ask questions. Use personal examples if you'd like. Um, where my relationship with Michael and Yahal really got cemented is I recently taught an eight-week seminar at the studio called Living a Healthy Lifestyle. And we incorporate, we looked at incorporating eight different aspects of our lives into a unified whole or unified principle. So that's where I want to start is with the principles. Okay, with principles, everything can just sort of, you can plug into your lives. Put this here, that there. Gives you the sort of the, the umbrella, paradigm umbrella. Okay. What is holistic health? It's the attaining of the highest levels of radiant health, inner peace, and joy-filled spiritual well-being. Shall I say it again? Okay. The purpose of holistic health or holistic living <clears throat> is the attainment of the highest levels of radiant health, inner peace, and spiritual well-being. Or as my teacher used to say, if you have any one of those three, the other two will fall in place. If you experience a state of radiant well-being, and please note, that's different than just well-being, which is different than just feeling well, or even just being healthy. For most of us, we would be happy just being healthy. Most people that I deal with, just feeling healthy, being healthy. And what is health? We'll talk more about that. And one model, very much a Western model, it's being symptomatic free. Okay, if you look up health in the dictionary, the definition of health is the absence of disease. So it's a model of trying to diminish rather than trying to build. Okay. So if you just felt well, let's say you, some of you would probably be very happy just having no symptoms in your life. 
no headaches, no fatigue, no irritability, no depression, no anxiety. That would be a fantastic state of being. But the model of holistic health goes beyond that. That's just the beginning. Okay. Or we could take inner peace. How many of you would give your left arm, right toe, and one of your kidneys to experience at least one day, five days, or even one year of peace of mind? Okay. All right. Maybe some of you have that. I don't know. I'm not going to assume. So inner peace, just the sense that everything is well and everything is in its right place in life. Or third, a sense of joy-filled spiritual well-being. I mean, the very word spiritual means all aspects of who we are. That there's an internal sense of everything as well. Things need not be different from that detach. Just pop it right here. Now, Well, more on that in a moment. True health is more than just eating right, exercising, or maintaining good habits. Those are a means to the end. I've seen countless people. I've, I've encountered thousands and thousands of people in the studios I've taught, in seminars, in different workshops and whatnot. And you see them making the effort, making the attempts to be well. Well, going out and walking for the first time in years. I was just talking to someone the other day who had been sick for many years and finally are getting themselves around to just doing, taking a daily walk. Right? So those, those efforts, those attempts, those are just means to an end. But it's not until we actually attain the goal when we truly experience a state of health and well-being that we have arrived. Right? So those, those attempts are essential, they're necessary. But today, again, I'm trying to open up your perspective. It's not just exercising. It's not just eating well. Okay, those are means to an end. True health is being captivated by nature's supreme craftsmanship, evidenced in the human body, mind, and spirit. Powerful. True health is more than just eating right, etc. It is a celebration of being alive. It's about being captivated by nature's supreme craftsmanship, evidenced in the human mind, body, and spirit. That the model of holistic living, the model of the East, is that there is within us this tremendous capacity for resilience and well-being. But for most of us, it's, it exists more in a kind of dormant state. And the methods, my experience, the methods of the East primarily are means to activate this sort of latent mechanism inside of us. My teacher says it exists in a belly. It's a kind of dynamic healing force, a dynamic healing presence. I think, just off the top of my mind, I think of acupuncture, different people I've known who've gone for acupuncture, people I've known who are acupuncturists. The principles are the same through all these different traditions. I think in the Mayan cultures, I think in the Egyptian methods, they all are coming from the same place that within us is this healing dynamic force, what can we do to access it? What can we do to, to have, to be able to utilize it in our daily lives? And preferably, not just when we have reached a health crisis. And that's what I want to talk about next, is, is health crisis. Okay. So I could go on and on and on talking about the beauties of healing. But the seed I want to plant is the potentials inside each one of us. We have figured out how to split the atom to generate a force 
that literally can destroy the planet, but we have yet to access the same atomic energy that exists within us. Okay, enough said on that? Okay. So, let's talk about what what I have found to be an extremely useful model to talk with Westerners about. And that's something in yoga we call the four stages of prana. Prana is a term inter used interchangeably with in uh, Chinese or Japanese culture, qi or chi, tai chi, um, and energy. energy, life force, uh, different cultures. What's that? Yeah, anyway. Um, prana means nature. And nature has one purpose, which is to help restore balance and equilibrium when it's lost or when it's been compromised. Nature exists outside of us, and nature functions inside of us. In yoga, we talk about prana in a big P. Prana is the force that's responsible for the governing of the movement of the stars, the planets, the galaxies on a very vast level or on a very uh, minute level, it's the function of the atoms, molecules, electrons, protons. So prana exists outside of us, big P, and prana exists inside of us, same force but internal, small p. And that force is designed to help restore us to balance when we are out of balance. My teacher used to often say, prana is what brings us to all of those things in our lives that are good and wonderful. Whenever we make attempts to eat better, surround ourselves with good, conscientious, loving company, uh, go to the doctor to get a checkup when normally we'd just be sort of apathetic. Okay? So let's talk about briefly the four stages of prana. Level one. There's an imbalance in the system. Stage one prana imbalance is when you start to feel sometimes uh, degrees of low energy, mild irritability, fatigue, um, a sense of something's off in your life. You can't quite name it. You can't quite put your finger on it, but you know it. You can feel it inside. Do you follow? Okay, some of you are probably there now. It's just something, I need something in my life. Okay, so the signal of nature, the message, the signals given by nature on a more, on a low level, mild level. Okay. Stage two prana, more predominance, more persistence in imbalance. In stage two prana, you might experience more frequent uh, indigestion, more chronic headaches, and generally there's a more persistent internal fatigue and exhaustion, a mental or physical exhaustion. In stage one and in stage two, the remedy is you can fix the problem more quickly and more readily. You have the opportunity to correct the imbalance. And you go and change your diet, or you go to the doctor, get a checkup, you start exercising, you start eating better, drinking more water, etc. So the control is still there. This control is still in your hands, in your life, to correct the imbalance. Do you understand so far? Okay. Now it's when we enter into what's called stage three of prana, more acute 
issues and problems. Those headaches that would happen maybe every few months now are happening every few weeks. You've gone from more mild fatigue to more chronic exhaustion. Your irritability levels are going up. Your body is breaking down. Some of you are talking about that. Okay, with me so far. In stage three, there's a crisis, but it's a low-level crisis. And you still have the ability to make a change in your life. But amazingly, particularly my research, much more in this culture than any other culture, people will still ignore the symptoms, resist. I think of my mother as a great example. She died far too young. She had an opportunity to turn it around, and she didn't. And to this day, it still baffles me, like, what happened to you? This beautiful woman that was my mother was like, what happened? She ignored the symptoms. She chose the path she chose. And so if you ignore even stage three, you're in disease mode, but it's not a disease where it's so bad that it's life-threatening, you can still, the possibility is still there to reverse the trend to reverse its progression. Stage two and three are primarily where more Michael and Yahel will encounter clients. Okay. And if you choose to ignore and persist in stage three, then automatically you, it will evolve into stage four. And stage four is when it has become a life-threatening illness and the outcome is almost imminent unless some kind of drastic, miraculous change occurs. Any questions or any examples you'd like to give? Someone you know, you yourself, or just trigger some thought in your mind, please. This prana, I had never heard that term before. I'm yeah. just doing a report on the wisdom of the body. Yes, mm -hmm. beautiful. By Bruno, what's his name? Kep Kep or whatever. No, never and heard it, it. It was really interesting is how the body innately Yes. has this ability to balance itself. Yes. So is that what you're experiencing? Yes, precisely. Yeah, you actually said it better than I did. So this prana is a mechanism of its function, is it's intelligent, and it's in design, by its design, it's to restore us to balance. And by the fact that many of us, through our habits and through our lifestyles, we have made choices, unfortunately, to ignore this intelligence, right? And I use an example, example I always use in class. It's 11 at night. Your body is exhausted. You know you need to go to bed. But then you order a pizza and you stay up and watch the Late Late Show. Okay, many, many examples like that. You know you, know you need to drink more water, but you're drinking more soda and coffee instead. Right? So, you know, it'd probably be good to go out for a walk two to three days a week, 20, 30 minutes. It would make you feel better. Oh, but it's nice just to stay indoors and, you know, let me just read my book another 20 minutes. Oh, time's up. We're going to talk a little bit more what that I call the sabotaging mechanism. What is it inside of us that while one part of us, one part of this intelligence operating in us is seeking health and well-being, there's another part that's constantly undermining it. But we're going to hold on that part in a moment. There's, uh, yeah. okay. there's, um, in, this is an example of sometimes how we just are speaking different languages but about the same thing. Western, the Western approach is not completely um, Far from this notion, uh, it's called homeostasis in, in physiology, which is a sense of balance. You need to have a sense of equilibrium and balance within your body. Now, Western physiology, of course, looks at it from a purely mechanistic point of view. Uh, you know, sodium being the right balance, and chloride, and and, and that uh, your blood pressure, etc. And of course, there's an underpinning to. Uh, to uh, a, a the, there's in fact in in uh, in Judaism and and in, in uh, and it's becoming also mainstream thanks to Madonna uh, Kabbalah uh, Kabbalah Prana is uh, is uh, referred to in in the uh, in Kabbalah as the Ein Sof which is the 
the infinite and and, uh, and the power that's outside of us that, that inv is invested in all of us it's it's the spark of God and and uh, it's the energy that's within us and it exists without and within <clears throat> and uh, the balance between the two of them is extremely important so again it's not these two divergent views they're in fact common views right. expressed in a different language thank you a great resource if you have not and would like to find that integration is Deepak Chopra he's brilliant and he has he's really the pioneer I think in most ways Deepak Chopra yeah Chopra you can ask afterwards if you'd like he's written many many books um, Western trained allopathic doctor but he grew up in a family that lived the yogic uh, lifestyle his parents were deeply Im immersed in the lifestyle I just wanted to add yeah, one thing please. relating to the wisdom of the body and of course the body does have the ability to balance but at the same time you know we have different energy centers and the body has the wisdom to tell us what is wrong like there's so different reason why you're getting a headache or you're why you're having a pain in your right shoulder because you're moving energy from different areas of your body and back pain can have so this is also one thing that we can get that alarm and start to look into it yeah. what is my body actually trying to tell me right beautiful thank you there, there's a reason there's actually a a, um, a phenomenon called the broken heart syndrome <laughs> where uh, the people will go into acute heart failure in uh, episodes when there's grief, like a, a son dies who, uh, uh, or, or uh, a family member dies. Hmm. And, 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 and uh, so Yael, when she's talking about it, and, and this is part of, you know, this is totally foreign and voodoo to Western medicine, is this notion that your organic display of disease is related to some non-organic event, mm. some 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 uh, some uh, imbalance in your life. Otherwise, that's that's translated into a heart attack or pancreatic cancer or whatever. Mm. Great, yeah, beautiful. Another source, if you're interested in trying to bridge a little bit, is Louise L. Hay. You can heal your life, and she. Yeah. Through her research, she's tracked what different um, imbalances in the body, headaches, what they relate to on a more broader level, on a holistic perspective, like maybe imbalance in your thinking. So many, many resources out there. All right, where I'd like to go next is to kind of get this down to a more immediate level where you guys can, it's more user-friendly, okay? And I want to talk about stress and relaxation. Okay. Um, using a, a Western model that I got from a doctor once, I want to talk about what is stress, distress, and tension. And these are could be a little bit used interchangeably. It could be just semantics. You could use different words and plan them in. Okay. Tension is a natural occurrence no, sorry, stress is a natural occurrence of nature. Stress is when you have the force of uh, regeneration and degeneration bumping at, up against each other. Nature is constantly, you know, exemplifying this force. Okay. So stress is natural. It's also, as I was taught, it's part of how the species evolves. When there's conditions of conflict, right? The, the, the battle, the, the fittest here. Those, those cells in us that win over the cells, you know, that are more constructive over the cells that are more destructive. So it's this constant, almost antagonistic relationship that helps evolve the species, etc. And we could go on and on and on about that. Distress is when you take situations that cause conflict and you take them personally. It's when you take a natural situation of tension. Let's say you meet somebody who's different than you 
or has a differing viewpoint than you. Okay, they stand for this and you stand for that. Right? And you encounter one another. And the possibility is that you two could grow and evolve from this interaction. But what ends up happening is you suddenly become segmented and you divide it and now there's distress. You've created more stress in the situation. I'm not quite articulating it well, but I think you get the idea. So, what we're aiming for is how to allow this natural process of conflict in our lives, of stress and tension. We're aging, we're moving, our bodies are degenerating naturally, but how can we get more energy and more health and well-being in that process? Okay, just use that as an example. What we want to learn to do is, again, to activate this regenerative process that exists inside of us. And it is very difficult to do that when we are in a state of constant stress or distress about what's happening naturally to us. Right? So my teacher said the key is to get to a place in our lives where we have more and more acceptance of the natural way of things. But we're Americans. And that is like a four-letter word. What do you mean accept? That's a form of giving up. That's a form of surrender. We don't surrender. Our whole country was started on not surrendering. The whole, Michael mentioned, the egocentric model is one of resistance and fight. It is not one of acceptance. And so what these models from the East, I think the, their greatest gift to this culture is the very basis that if we can become more accepting of what is, more accepting of the conditions of adversity in our lives, the conditions of conflict, the conditions of stress or distress, if we can become more okay with and accepting with what is, what is not okay, then that's the first step. It's not the end step. It's the first step in being able to resolve whatever problem it is we're working on. And in the course that I taught, I use what's called the 3A principle. The first step is actually awareness. And I'm giving a very brief summary of what we went over through eight weeks. First, you need to become aware that there's a problem. And I think that's where Western medicine is one of its greatest contributions. You can see it, you can measure it, it's right there, you go to the doctor, boom, thank you. I now know what's going on, right? So the gift of Western medicine, among other things. But where most people turn at that moment, where most people go, is they turn it now into a, relation, a relationship of conflict. Whatever their condition, whatever their issue, there now begins a relation, an adversarial conflicted relationship. And so, so much of what we do in the holistic field is we try to then work with people. When I'm seeing patients, clients in my office, most of what we end up needing to do right off the bat is to try to shift their relationship with whatever issue or condition they have from one to conflict to one of more acceptance and hopefully eventually harmony. Now it's usually at this point inevitably that after a lecture somebody will come up and come at me straight boom. You, you're saying that I should be okay with what I'm going through? You're saying that I should be accepting of this condition? And I say yes. Because what you're doing by resisting is you are undermining your body's natural capacity to heal. But even greater than that, and much more immediate to that, is we are depleting our energy. We are draining the very energy that we need to be able to, con to, be able to combat whatever condition we're dealing with. And so I want to present now the very base, the model of holistic health, the, the foundation of it, the key to living well and healthy and happy in your life is to get more and more energy from what you do in your life. 
to get more and more energy and fulfillment from everything that we do. We put out so much energy in our jobs. We give out so much energy to our children, our spouses, our mothers, our daughters. We give out energy to our managing our bank accounts, to doing this, to doing that. That by the end of the day, most of us were depleted and were exhausted. How many of you sometimes or often deal with low energy? Okay, and not all of you are raising your hand. That's cool. How many of you would like more energy? Okay, that's everybody raised their hand. Low energy. Too much trouble to raise your mind. Yes, I'm too tired. The byproduct of stress or distress is low energy. And it very quickly starts to turn into a vicious cycle. In our attempts to get out of our low energy state, we turn to typically more artificial means. We turn outside ourselves. Go get a Pepsi. Take an Advil. We do whatever we can outside of us to try to stem the tide the onslaught sometimes of this growing disease that Michael mentioned, this imbalance and the fatigue that comes with it. And also, you know, it's, it reminds yeah. me of many sentences. I talk to patients, people, and they say, yeah, I have, I have high blood pressure. Oh, okay. Well, I'm seeing my doctor next week. Let's see what he wants to do with it. It's like their, their blood pressure, it's their doctors. And he's going to deal with it. They are nothing. So mm -hmm. there's like... I'm giving, this is my body, but he's going to take it. He's got the responsibility. He's going to fix it. And right. this is where, as, as the pastor is saying, I really need to check in and see right. what's going on. Right. So. right. Yeah, beautiful. That's beautiful. We, there, put, we there, get the authority out there, there. There was a recent survey that came out. It was actually a scientific study. And, and baby boomers define health oh, that's as so health, as yeah. access to health. Huh. That, that's how they define health. The vast majority of baby boomers think that the definition of good health is having access to a physician or a provider or whatever. Get an MRI in, today. in other words, they've <laughs> completely let go of the responsibility for their own health and have right. put it in the, you know, the priesthood of the physician or the, the nurse or, or, or the therapist yeah. and, and mm -hmm. have taken, given up their own responsibility for their own health. Right. I think, yes, and even you could say they, most people feel they fulfilled their responsibility to themselves by going, handing, to, by going to the doctor and that that's where it stops, right? So obviously, you guys, I think, see through some yeah. of that enough that you're You here. wouldn't be here, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> right, now here's the bigger problem. The problem gets worse. Not only do we get stressed, we then become stressed about being stressed. <laughs> That's American. That's American, yes. That is America. It's like, there's a problem. Oh no, there's a problem. <laughs> Let's get busy doing something about it. Well, there's another little piece, a little cliche. Not only are we tired, but as a culture, and I think increasingly as a planetary body, we are increasingly becoming tired of being tired. We're not only tired, but we're growing exhausted by our own fatigue our own lack of resilience. The big buzzword in a lot of the psychotherapeutic circles these days and the conferences is resilience. My understanding of resilience is something, it's a, it's a degenerative force that you feel inside of you. Follow? And so almost every attempt most of us make to try to get well, we end up cutting ourselves off. Because our efforts themselves come from a place of reaction and distress. We're not proactive or strategic, we're reactive. And I see this all the time. People walk through the doors in our studio, just, and so many people have come through, they don't even know what yoga is. 
I recently led a three-day retreat. A woman just saw it mentioned on a website. She didn't know what it was about. And she decided just to show up. And I was like, do you know what's about to happen in these three days? No, but I'm curious. So people are seeking and searching. They just don't know where to find it. And it all begins essentially with this understanding that if we could just get a little bit more aligned and a little bit more connected to our own sense of innate intelligence, our own wisdom, that we can work in partnership with whatever model and system we use. I also don't advocate to clients and students to just give all your power away to the next healing system. But then we can start getting into, there's something called healthy suspicion or doubt as opposed to cynical doubt. Steve Jobs, by the way, is a great example of that. Steve Jobs died of pancreatic cancer. He was diagnosed with pancreatic cancer when he had a little lump that was operable, probably would have survived. And he chose to go the alternative medicine route completely. He was into TM, I think, for years. Yeah, he meditated. And, and, and by the time he... By the, by the time he finally said, okay, maybe this isn't working for me, it was inoperable and he died. Had he, had he said, okay, I need a little bit of Western medicine, and then he probably could have very much da uh, benefited from the other stuff to take right. through the trauma of his body being invaded because he would have had a terrible operation called the Whipple's procedure that basically cores out the middle of your body, uh, and, but, but might have saved his life. Amazing. Yeah, took that movie. I don't know if you've seen on um, Netflix. Jobs. It's a pretty cool movie about Steve Jobs. Two nervous systems. You want to know? Two nervous systems. Sympathetic. I kill you. <laughs> okay. Inherited, passed on for thousands of years from thousands of years ago from our ancestry, Neanderthals and beyond. Every time we're in a situation where we feel we're at a threat, we react precisely and exactly in the same way that our ancestry did as if our life was at stake. Somebody cuts us off. Well, that's not the best example because that could be life-threatening. Mm -hmm. um, somebody says something insulting to us. Um, somebody doesn't take out the garbage when they promise ten times. You left the dishes in the sink. You have bad breath. Whatever your triggers are, I'm, I'm not coming up with best examples. But we respond. There are 11 responders that go on in our bodies. Our pupils dilate. Our intestines contract. Our heart rate accelerates. Our pancreas secretes. 11 responders. It doesn't matter the conditions. The problem is while we have evolved in our Western enlightened model very far in technology, our species, our internal development is way behind. The good news is through these methods and these models and through the techniques offered, primarily I call it from the Eastern traditions, but there are other beautiful traditions, we can accelerate our internal evolution much faster and I have witnessed this for countless people with severe illness, disease, cancers, extreme mental imbalances, manic depression. Uh, I've treated many people with panic attacks. I recently had a client who had, she came in from Syracuse, drove in with her mother and we spent essentially seven days working on her suicidality and she's fine now. So these models, these methods can work. But you have to have that moment of faith. You have to be willing to suspend this, if you can't see it and measure it, it's not real for me. That is the Western way. It's the deductive approach, inductive reasoning, deductive reasoning or something. It's the basis of science, Western science. It's a beautiful model, it works, but it has its limitations. Okay, my teacher used to, oh, so the other model, uh, the other nervous system that you really want to get plugged into is called, anybody, parasympathetic. And that's the system when you feel calm, when you feel relaxed, 
when you're not under the constant influence of ah, what's happening to me, what's happening, and then to try to get yourself out of this reactive state, I got to do something about it. Ah, you should see how much, how much time and energy I spend trying to uncoil clients who come in. They feel anxious, and now they're getting anxious about the fact that they're anxious. Oh my God, I got to do something about the fact that I'm anxious all the time, and now they're just spinning. How many of you have anxiety sometimes when you understand the cycle? Sometimes. Sometimes, yeah, exactly. <laughs> if you're honest, how many of you have anxiety on some level all the time? All right, so how do you activate? So I'm moving in now to the, the, sort of the final phase of what I wanted to go over with you today. How can you get this system, this miraculous system called the parasympathetic, more in full operation? Well, simple, ma simple uh, practice. Please take a deep breath in right now. <clears throat> Hold the breath in. Breathe in again. Breathe in again. Breathe in again. Now exhale and feel as you exhale a slight calming sensation. It's not when you take a deep breath in that you relax. I'd say more of a sympathetic response. <gasps> the problem with my view of mankind is nobody exhales. <gasps> I was in a, a seminar workshop years and years ago in New York City, and the workshop leader, it was a very intense workshop, had us one by one, there was about 20 of us, stand up in front of the group with our hands down and our feet separated. Talk about awkward. Not allowed to speak. And just simply breathe. And what they led us through was, and I got it when I stood up there, it was only when people exhaled that you could see them actually calm down. So all this emphasis in our culture, you just need to take a deep breath. You need to let go. And it's only on exhaling that we let go. I'm talking metaphorically and I'm talking really. If you could notice during the course of your day, every time you hold your breath, breathe shallow or breathe rapid, in and of itself will help, will be that one of those first steps in unraveling and reversing the cycle. Any question or comment about that? Is that why when people have an anxiety attack, they let them breathe into a paper bag? Not exactly. I'm not sure why they did that. Off of what they're doing. Right. The, the, the emphasis on the paper bag. <laughs> it's, it could it's, be a mind. It's, it's a, um, it's actually, first of all, de been debunked. We, it's, 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 uh, it's advocated not to do that anymore because there's been several people who've had become hypoxic from that. Uh, but, right. but, but the notion was is that because you're hyperventilating when you're having an anxiety attack, right. you're blowing off carbon dioxide. Right. And so to breathe into the paper bag, you're, you're rebreathing your carbon dioxide. Yeah, there's an imbalance in the carbon dioxide and, and oxygen and, levels. And, and, and it doesn't work. Oh. So don't try that at home. It's, it's, it's the, the, the best thing for the, the best thing actually is is exactly what uh, and that's what I do when I have people come in with anxiety attacks and it works very well. Is I have patients say, okay, just take a s slow down your breathing, take a breath and hold it, and then let it go. Okay, so good. That's one technique. There are about eight hundred and seventy-three million more. What do you do if that doesn't work? I went to so many different people and nothing worked. I had to find more desperate measures. Let's try another technique. If you don't mind, just put your feet flat on the floor. You don't have to shift anything. Clench your fists. It's the principle of um, homeopathy. Have you heard of homeopathy? Homeopathy, you induce the symptom to help create a shift. Okay, take a deep breath in. Be careful if you have high blood pressure, please. <laughs> Don't overdo this. Clench your fists, squeeze your shoulders, tighten your face, and be one big stress ball. Squeeze your back muscles, chest muscles, stomach muscles, squeeze like you're just gonna burst. And now instantly, ha, ah, open your hands and let go. 
Okay, just feel that momentary response. It may last only three seconds, but that's a beginning. Okay, all of yoga is the method. I think it's called PDF. I don't know. I used to know all the technical terms in physiology. It's a it's an isometric method. You contract. You induce tension to release tension. You contract the muscle in order to release the muscle. That's what yoga is, basically. Okay. Qigong and Tai Chi enter it through a different approach. It's about circulation. I was, I'm taught now by my Indian teacher, the true key to all health is circulation. What slows down as we get older? Circulation. What cleans your blood, your tissue? Circulation. What happens to our joints? They need to get flushed. So my teacher says you need to do all, in all these different energy methods and exercise, all of it is to kick your circulatory system up to a higher and higher level of functioning. Okay, what's the thing we want to do when we most get older? <laughs> Slow down and give in to the inevitable. My one wish, someone once, I remember watching a documentary on Mother Teresa. Her one wish before she did leave was, I want to die moving full steam ahead, serving humanity. Wouldn't you know, she was out serving and walking. Apparently she got a heart attack or whatever happened. Died while she was serving, literally moving. What a great way to go. It's what you want to do, and it happened. All right. So, how can you get your energy? Let me finish with. Let me bring it all full circle. All of these methods are all designed. They're the I call the um, the physics of energy. Everything in these Western or Eastern models are designed to get more energy and to be able to sustain that energy at higher and higher levels. There are two ways to get more energy in your life. One, use the energy you have more consciously and more thoughtfully, more skillfully. Notice those things in your life, those activities and those relationships where you put out your energy, but you don't get a return. Okay, notice those activities you do that don't, I say, I use the words nourish or feed you. Feed you meaning you walk away feeling good. You walk away feeling like you're smiling inside and outside. You feel better. It's really that simple. If you're doing activities and you're not feeling better, those are activities that are depleting your energy. Do you follow? Those hobbies, those things that you, those people you surround yourself that you enjoy. And we all talk about, isn't the model of uh, retirement that then we can enjoy our lives? But what ends up happening for most people is by the time they get to that age, all they, their experience is the sum total of the way they've lived their life up until that moment. All the same stress-producing habits, all the same things that they do that are self-destructive and undermining their health. Do you think that's going to change once you kick back on your sofa? Hell no. You're back in a sofa, now your mind's busy agitating. Oh no, my grandchildren, my children. Oh no, what's going to happen tomorrow? Oh no, oh no. Our lives, as the Buddha has said, our lives are the sum total of every thought and every action we've lived up until this moment. So my teacher also, a different teacher from India, says, start now. Start now. And it's like putting money in your bank account. And for most people, they're living off their principal. As soon as they put money in the account, a little crisis happens, they have to withdraw. All right, they do good things, they start to get a little better. I'm sure many of you have had experiences, you start to feel well and boom, something happens and you're bowled over in your life. And you got to start all over again. It's like such a drag. So do little things, good things, to nurture yourself, to love your body, as we say in yoga, to feed your body and mind, feed your heart and spirit, so that eventually you build up enough principle, you have enough money in your account, that you can start to live off the interest. You can become like a Dalai Lama. Wherever he goes, he just spreads so much joy and happiness. 
and just think about what that man has been through and what he's witnessed, the decimation of an entire society. And yet he's constantly happy, the stories of people around him. He just gives off so much delight and love and, and beauty and joy. Sound good? So little steps, everyone, little things. You don't necessarily have to go out like, oh, I'm going to do this and do that. I don't recommend it. Little things. Build up some momentum in your life. Okay. Any last comments or questions? And then we'll pass the buck over here. Please. Yeah. One, just in relationship to what you're yeah. saying, I was part of a volunteer group. And helping others, really, you know, when you saw that you could change somebody's life, yeah. it, it just gave me so much energy. I Beautiful. said, I don't need a car to drive home. I can fly home. I saw good. Awesome. And so I came up with this mantra. It's in giving that you receive. And it, Beautiful. You know, I just kept saying that. Awesome. Pat Carbone, who's sitting right here, is a great, great example of that. She volunteers a lot, a lot. I'm, and, on, I'm on everything. <laughs> and 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 she she's I think it leads and, and, and it, it it gives an immense immense amount, amount of uh, contribution to her mental health. But you see, that really is my healer. That makes me feel so good to do something for others. Beautiful. It really does. Beautiful. I just don't mean. I volunteer at McLean's upon occasion, things like that, but yeah. but I'm on committees in town. But it's it's a variety of things that I do that keeps me interested and keeps Beautiful. me going. Beautiful. So service is one way. Mm -hmm. At the same time, some of us have made it our personal religion to give, 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 that we have nothing left for ourselves. So I always advocate for every student and client, you need to also be selfish for your own needs. Be sure you're attending to your own needs so that you can be more available to other people. But so many, and I deal with so many mothers, for example, they're just giving out all the time, they're, they're depleted. The very idea of giving just generates so much resentment and resistance internally. So if that's where you're at, and you probably need to focus on yourself. Get your own needs met and then turn around and be able to help others. There's so many in my profession that just get burned out eventually. And that's, that has to do with the fact that they haven't really done their own internal work enough. So many people in the healing profession haven't done their own work enough. So, all right, so take care of your well-being. And then as an overflow, it'll just come out of you. People, you won't even have to do much of anything. People will be around you and they'll just start feeling better. Doesn't that sound wonderful? You can just kick back like this and people just start smiling because they can feel something coming off of you. And there's some different saints, I think, in all the different religious traditions. There's one great saint in India. He spent probably about 40, 50 years almost lying horizontal. And he had some of the greatest impact on and throughout Western civilization. Many institutions came out of it. Many uh, methods and traditions came out of what he offered. He didn't really talk that much, but he was just very happy all the time. All right, any last piece? I have a question, maybe yeah. not uh, related. I'm curious about your professional or new name you took. Uh, what's the meaning of it? Oh, you mean Shankara. Right. Um, it was given to me by my teacher. Um, Amma, it's called the Hugging Saint, and she travels the world, um, and she's hugged, in the last 40 years, she's hugged over 28 million people, and she's like, you talk about that ever-ready battery bunny, that's Amma. She, she lives the model of service, truly, and, and just constantly feels energy. Um, when I met Amma about 20 years ago, it was like, Oh, that's what real happiness looks like. And I urge you just to take a look, you know, to see. She helps the UN. She, the UN turns to her for a great many activities. Um, she was a major, um, she played a major role in the tsunami relief. Anyway, I'm getting on a tangent with Amma. But look up under amma.org, A-M-M-A.org, if you'd like, and just see. Just somebody, in my opinion, just they embody happiness. And she just serves humanity. That's all she does is just give, 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 give. So, oh, and the name, I asked her for a name, and she gave me the name Shankara. Is there a meaning to it? Yeah, it means, um, it means many things, but it means auspicious one. 
And when I actually went up to her and I said, Amma, what does my name mean? She looks at me and she goes, Shankara, Shankara, Shankara. <laughs> she wouldn't tell me what it meant. So I had to go look it up. She wanted me to live it. The spiritual names in yoga are, I think, much like Hebrew names. It's more of an essence of who we are. You know, something to aspire to in our true nature. Please. Isn't she coming to Boston? Yes. Yeah, she'll be here in a week and a half. You can go get a hug. Or you can sit in the back and just watch all these people. You're, no, 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 not yet. Not yet. <laughs> um, it's just amazing. You just walk in. To be with somebody who just gives off pure love and doesn't want anything. And she's one of many, I think. And, she, and there's not just yoga. There's other traditions out there. So, But anyway, they're out there. There are many great traditions and healers. Just check them out. They're all over the place. You just got to open your eyes a little bit. All right. Any last questions, comments, anything? We talk a little bit about meditation. And that's yeah. something that... I'd like to incorporate it in my life, and I, Good. I've tried to do it on my own, but it's very difficult. Do it in a group. I don't recommend the Westerners to do anything on their own. We're, we do everything on our own. All right? And there's, there's an isolation that's really incorporated into a lot of our approaching, our approaches. So surround yourself. It's much easier to do it when you're with like-minded people. And that's why yoga studios have become bastions and yeah. other holistic centers. It's like there are now 25 to 30 million people who do yoga on average in this culture. And it's growing exponentially. Mm -hmm. um, a great, great book if you want to read the history of yoga in the Founding Fathers. Much of our constitution was designed by people who modeled it after the thinking of the yogic scriptures. So, you know, it's not that yoga is better. I'm not into saying that. It's just these principles. Um, Emerson and Thoreau were immersed in, in these doctrines. So it's called American Veda, V-E-D-A. -E it's a fascinating read if you're interested in that. Are you offering, I mean, obviously we're all here, so you're talking about these wonderful things. Are yeah. you offering all this here soon, or how would you? What, what, what Yael and I had, uh, what we'd like to do, uh, the people seated up here and, and many others is w we'd like to offer, uh, we, we already have, we've had several clients who come in and they're not patients, uh, you know, they're, they're people who are seeking to achieve this level of, of well-being that, that Shankar talked about. So, yeah, Al and I would uh, take you in and um, do a holistic slash medical uh, evaluation. And um, so I'll do the mechanical part that I know well and, you know, take blood pressure and see what medications you're on and, and, and take a medical history and do a physical exam. And then both Yael and I, mostly Yael, who is far more intuitive and far more skilled at it, will tease out of you what it is in your life that's brought you to the place that you are right now. And then after that has been achieved, then we'll come up with a, um, a plan, an action plan to go to where you want to be. And, and that action plan will include possibly, if that's what, what's, what, what, what we feel is fits, uh, fits your goal, Shankara, or uh, Dr. Payne, or uh, we have, we have, uh, nu we have holistic nutritionists on our staff, and, and, we, have, uh, and uh, we have massage therapists, and, and, and so and, and what we're, we're trying to do is, and then we'd have you come back in three months, and we'd measure some of the objective things, that, those things that Western medicine are good at. We measure blood pressure, we measure how much medication you need, how much this and that. And the goal would be to diminish your reliance on these external supports and rely more on your internal mechanisms and the force that's within you to, to achieve health and wellness. But the future, I mean, we might, because we are getting bigger and bigger groups of people, so it's nothing that, right now it's not happening, but we might have a group, you know, Shaka would come here. Once in a while, we can have a meditation group. Or... And this model yeah. is not new. I don't know if some yeah. of you, there was a great series, Healing of the Body and Mind, with Bill Moyers. And they showed, like you go to in China, they showed you would walk into a hospital and you'd go right, allopathic medicine. You go left, and there were 
all of the yeah. traditional methods. Yeah. So, you know, this isn't, it's beautiful what Michael and Yehel are doing. It's really beautiful. It's, but realize it's already the model that's being used mm -hmm more and more and more out there. I have more and more people I know in the Western medical field seeking, looking to incorporate. I have many clients who work at different institutions in the area. So um, can I read you one last a little quote to finish my piece? And this is, uh, I have my, my friend part, uh, phone it, to, text it to me. So this, this summarizes and highlights what I call the importance of fighting, but fighting on behalf of our well-being. There's a great fight that is happening and needs to happen and needs to continue to happen. And I think this, this is called the, uh, the old Cherokee man, the story of two wolves. I may weep a little bit, this is always so moving to me. An old Cherokee man was teaching his grandson about life after he had had a fight with one of his friends. And the grandfather, he turned, the Cherokee grandfather turned to his grandson and said, there is a great fight going on inside all of us. It is a terrible fight that exists between two wolves. One is evil, he is angry, envious, jealous, arrogant, proud, superior, and egotistic, egotistical. I'm summarizing a bit. The other wolf is good, full of hope, joy, love, peace, and serenity, and kindness. The young boy turned to his grandfather, Grandpa, which one wins? And he says, the one that you feed. So as Thich Nhat Hanh, a great um, Tibetan Buddhist teacher, says, we all have these different parts inside of us that we'd rather not, you know, we, don't, we judge in others, we judge in the world. We all have parts that maybe we don't like. But which one are we going to feed from this point on? Hey, which one are we going to highlight? So, thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. I wanted to introduce uh, a little bit about acupuncture, uh, but I wanted to first, uh, I don't have as eloquent a quote as Shankara just gave you, but I've got a, a pretty good one. <laughs> and that was uh, Deng Xiaoping uh, talking about the integration of Western and Eastern medicine that China has done a very good job of integrating. And the, the, uh, the quote was, what is the best cat, the white cat or the black cat? And the answer is, the best cat is the cat that catches the rat. And that's what integrative medicine is. It's the cat that catches the rat. It's common sense medicine and it's uh, uh, the uh, the, the medicine of the future is really world medicine that incorporates all the best elements. Western medicine has areas in which it excels. It's incredible. Uh, Chinese medicine, Ayurvedic medicine, uh, healing therapies of all kind, including Reiki and others, are fabulous. But they each have their place, and a lot of those places overlap. There's some general, some broad categories for Chinese medicine, at the best, best known component of which is acupuncture. Uh, but uh, in general, we work with uh, a, a holistic concept, which basically means, just as other traditions say, it's body, mind, and spirit. But we look at the practical ways of making your life work based upon your own self-responsibility. This is the key of, of uh, Chinese medicine. It's uh, the greatest treasure that China produces. It's the oldest medicine in the world. It gives Ayurvedic medicine is is a is a is a, a, a runner in that race as well. But uh, it's got such a tremendous history of experience and of uh, of uh, documentation of of uh, results that it really stands out. 
the uh, the literature is extensive and it goes back a long, long time, back to uh, the early uh, Greek times of the the golden age of Greece and and somewhat before. But the uh, the long and short of it is one of the most progressive uh, aspects of modern medicine is Chinese medicine, and acupuncture again being the 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 one that we get paid for. The, there are other aspects of Chinese medicine that are more important, but don't get as much uh, uh, recognizance in the medical field. It starts really with meditation and with attitude. I mean, all of the, the Shankar's talk is, is essentially the same talk that I would give, although I'm going to make mine just a little bit of a teaser because we'll, we'll be speaking at a at greater length later on. But it all starts with attitude, and the attitude is, what can I do for my health, and how can I take responsibility for my health, and what are the tools that I'm going to have? And then uh, diet and exercise as key components, and then only does acupuncture and herbs enter the, the picture. But in our society, because we shortcut everything, and we want to have something that has a uh, uh, ICD-9 code to it, <laughs> we, we have acupuncture as, uh, as our primary modality in that field. But the, uh, the, the key takeaway for most of our folks is that we give people a very, and uh, Yehel alluded to it, a very quick jolt, uh, energy boost, uh, uh, impetus into a very high state of being with acupuncture. It's the most remarkable thing to me. Uh, I got involved quite a long time ago in the early 80s and, and uh, uh, there, the, the 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 study was all about the uh, the the Western medical treatment of disease with acupuncture, but we were concentrating really on helping people alleviate their symptoms. But what I found primarily was that almost invariably people would say that they had never felt so good in their lives. Meditation, prayer, focus reaching a state of, of homeostasis or, or balance or, or that, uh, that harmony of all the things that make us human uh, is a wonderful state. It's the zone. It's the place that we all want to be in as much of the time as we can be. And what we find with acupuncture is you get there real quick. Now, as uh, a, a very good teacher, Swami Venkateshananda said, it's Easy to wake up, but terribly difficult to stay awake. <laughs> so, so what we what we do is we help people wake up, and you go, gee, I really this I, I didn't realize I could feel this great, and then we help them stay awake, and that is with the uh, dietary guidelines and uh, guidelines for exercise routines and for uh, stress reduction routines. Um, interestingly enough, in our clinic, because I've been around for a while, uh, I picked up a lot of stuff. I was a student of Swami Satchin Ananda back in 1967 when I was a 17-year-old uh, kid in, in high school. And uh, I stayed with him for a better part of 30 years. And uh, uh, the upshot is that uh, the idea of being able to uh, sustain a lifestyle that gave you a lot of peace of mind and it gave you uh, techniques for keeping that peace of mind uh, takes a, a, a concerted effort. And this is where, where acupuncture is, is, is very helpful. Uh, we bring in that kind of thing so people can listen to tapes of Swami Satyananda. They can listen to tapes of the Dalai Lama who is, uh, who's, anybody who's seen him or heard him, you know, he's an incredibly inspiring guy. Um, we also listen to, people can listen to Stoics. We have a lot of uh, the, the, the meditations of Marcus Aurelius and classical music and Reiki music. So we have all these things available with, through the technology of iPods and, and, uh, and, and Pandora and, and other uh, ways of getting oral communication to people. So we try to people, get people into a state of mind that is conducive to their health. So the, the, the idea is that if you are looking for a way to 
get through symptomology because that's where everybody starts. You know, if, you're, if, you're, if your life is already sorted out, you, there's really no impetus to, to change. We start with symptoms and problems and generally they're long-standing chronic issues related to pain or digestion or to musculoskeletal dysfunction or to accidents, uh, workers' comp stuff or car wrecks. So that's where people come from. And then typically where people go is a much greater appreciation of how much their life really is together already. And they don't realize that until they get that experience directly. So it's an induced meditation. It's an induced uh, inspiration of what's already there that just gets uncovered a little bit more quickly uh, in a little, with a little greater degree of amplification. Uh, it's, it's part of a, of a, of a long range process that I think humanity is going through and certainly America is going through of self-responsibility and of taking charge of our our lives from all standpoints. You got to be healthy to be uh, functional. You need to have a, a technique that you can use or a series of techniques, a toolbox that you can use on your own. But you need fundamentally to make a decision. I want to get healthy. I want to stay healthy. I want to be an example to my friends, to my family. Uh, and I want to figure out what it's going to take to give me the education and the experience of doing that on a regular basis to, uh, to sustain that and to have a progressive system for moving forward. And this is where I think uh, the, 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 uh, the integrative approach, the common sense medicine approach, the, the, uh, the, the medicine of, of the future is going to be exactly as Michael and Yehel and, and Shankara have outlined. You have to draw from all the traditions. You have to use what's right at the right time. And you have to be, make fundamentally a decision that you're in control. Nobody else is in control. Uh, and then assert your, your independence and uh, get a direct experience. Because acupuncture, more than other approaches is very experiential. You're there for 45 minutes or an hour. You're right there. You're feeling it. You're, you're contemplating what your state of mind is or what you can do about it. And you transcend it. You hit a zone uh, during an acupuncture treatment. And I know for a fact because I do it for myself and I get my kids to work on me to put me in that place as well if I can't reach the points. So but you, you, it's a demonstrable place of getting to an area that, that prayer gets to, that exercise gets to, when you particularly if you do it for a long time and you're, and you're uh, in a in a aerobic zone, it's a place where you know that the world is right, that you got issues to deal with, but you have a potential that's very real and tangible and experiential of a very high state of health, a very high state of cognition, the chance to age better, the chance not to have health problems uh, nag you, the chance to think above the typical uh, uh, verbiage of the Western medical group, which many of us rejected earlier on, of being a victim of our symptoms, of having things be intransigent, of having things be incurable. There's, there really is no such thing. You, there, there are certain limitations, but in general, we can elevate ourselves to a much higher place than we ever really thought. And the beauty of, of acupuncture is that it can take you there real quick. And then after that, it's a matter of sustaining it and figuring out what you do in your own life to help uh, 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 maintain that for your life and to be able to spread it to your, your environment. So that's, a, that's it in a nutshell. And, uh, <laughs> and the next and the next time we'll talk yeah. more about it. We'll, we'll uh, reconvene here. I hope many of you will, uh, if, if, and, and more of you, to tell your friends. Uh, and and uh, we'll do another session, I think, of the yeah, fall we'll after the September. summer. Yes, after um, because people are going away now. We gotta go to Cape Cod. Yeah. Gotcha. So um, a few things. If you are going for a vacation, really try to enjoy it because, as an American way, I guess we need to go for and work hard to plan it and to have money and to do kayaking, but just take a moment every day and make sure you love yourself. The, 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 the spirituality is, <laughs> is defined by Torsky as being grateful for what you have. Yes. And just enjoy it. Enjoy, enjoy and celebrate 
the being of yourself every day. I mean, this is, I think, has been my biggest lesson in life. For many, many years, I really did not understand what does it mean to love yourself. I mean, what is, I'm here, this is me. But once you get there, that's really that moment of joy. Uh, I want to thank who has been here, and I also, I would like to thank Ahuva. Ahuva is one of the best chefs ever that I have ever wow. known in my life. But her specialty That's is me. that she can prepare, make food, or teach you how to make it, or whatever, at your home, outside, and in many, many versions that is healthy. And what we are offering here today is uh, everything free, you know, the gluten-free, dairy-free, whatever free, <laughs> vegan, vegetarian, all that list. She can make it. So um, if you have any more Funding for Simsbury Community Television is provided in part by contributions from viewers like you. Thank you.